the topic of my presentation is the medical optimization of stable or unstable patients. And I will talk in the next 20 minutes about this topic. And I will show you, I hope so, seven steps to more safety in this question. I will start with a typical case. It's an 88-year-old man. He had sustained a bad trochanteric fracture. The patient fell on the way to the toilet two hours ago. And now you got the call from the emergency room at half past seven. Can we plan the surgery in the next two hours? And I will ask you, what is your answer now? First, I have another question. Who of you works already in the autogeriatric team? One, two, three, okay. So we ha can have only three for the answer B. <laughs> All other have to uh, choose another answer and please vote now. Yes, we can, like Obama would say, or you should wait till tomorrow because tomorrow you are on holiday and go skiing and it's not your problem, or you will come and check the patient. <laughs> okay, 58% says I will come and check the patient. I think this is the right answer and I will give you seven steps on this way. So, if we have the question time versus pre-operative optimization, we have always considered these two Factors. One is the factor time. We know that we should operate the patient between 24, maximum 48 hours. On the other hand, our patients have a lot of comorbidities that may influence the outcome, and we always have to think about the possibility of an optimization of the patient. The step one is, I will tell you, ask the patient what happened. It's a very simple question, but it's very important because maybe you get two important answers. One answer is the patient didn't know what happened, so maybe she suffers by dementia or she's already in a delirium. This is one important point. The second point is what was the cause of the fall? And here you have to think of a syncope. It's a brief loss of consciousness. And this is very important because on the other hand, only 10% of all falls are caused by a syncope, but a syncope could be a symptom of a severe cardiovascular cerebral problem. And this makes problem in, during the operation and also in the post-operative episode. And causes of syncopes are cardiac arrhythmia, a structural cardiac disease, for example, aortic stenosis. I will show you this is important, and also cerebral vascular disease. It's also a fact that in 90% of all causes, the, uh, the origin of the syncope stays unknown. That's also a fact. But you have to ask this very simple question because it's very important for the outcome of the patient. And so, in the step one, that's why an ECG makes always sense. In patients also with or and without a syncope in the anamnesis. On this slide, you see atrial fibrillation. It's not a great problem. It's normal frequency between 60 and 100, so it's no reason for a delay of the operation. And in many departments, yeah, the computer makes the analyze of the ECG, so you can see normal or abnormal ECG, and this is also an important information. Step two, check the patient for a heart murmur and an edema of the lung. And this is very simple, but many of you, I think, will don't do it. <laughs> This is aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis is a very severe disease for an elderly patient, and it's not really a contraindication for the operation because you have no possibility to operate the aortic stenosis before the hip fracture. But it's important for the colleagues from the anesthesia to know whether the patient suffers by aortic stenosis or not because the management is completely different during the operation. And how can you diagnose it? All of you have this very nice instrument in your pocket. It's a stethoscope, and you have to use it. It's very simple. And where can you listen? You can listen here. In the second intercostal area, you can hear an aortic stenosis. It always sounds like that. And everyone can hear it. 
It's really very simple. And if you hear nothing or only okay, there is no problem. The patient has no really aortic stenosis, maybe a very low grade, but it doesn't matter. And the second, what you can hear, is also the edema of the lung. And if you take a straw and a glass of water and you blow into the glass, you can hear the bubbles. And you can same, hear the same over the lung. The bubbles go up. You just have to hear and to listen to the patient and use your stethoscope. It's very easy, but it's very useful. Step three. We have discussed this morning already the X-ray. I think also the X-ray is important for geriatric patients. On the one hand, you can see uh, edema of the lung, and you can also see maybe a acute chest infection. This may be an indication for a delay of the operation. On the other hand, you have to also to look for edema, peripheral edema, for a sign of heart failure. And if you have a heart failure, and you have four, this is breathlessness, it's a contraindication, it's an indication for optimization of the patient. It's very simple. Look at the chest X-ray, look at the peripheral edema. Step four is the physical examination. At the physical examination, you have to look for clinical signs of dehydration. You have to ask for weight loss. You have to look for loose skin and remaining faults, not over the hand here, but here on the chest. That's the right point. And also, you have to look for trimucosa, hypertension, and the collapse of the neck venous. Because dehydration is very a very great problem for a patient. And the predictors are very common in geriatric patients. It's fever, it's dementia, dysphagia, gyro, the use of diuretics, laxatives, and also diabetes mellitus. Step five is check the comorbidities. And the elderly patients falls as a consequence of his multimorbidity. And that's the reason, that's the real reason. She is ill and she falls, and not she falls and then she gets ill. That's the wrong way. And these are data from our own hospital. You see heart failure in 32% of the patients, cerebral vascular disease, more than 20%, diabetes, more than 70%, and also cancer, more than 10%. So the patients we have to deal with are really, really ill. And the multimorbidities, the comorbidities, have also an influence of the outcome of the patient. These are recent data published 2010 in the checks, and you see here the mortality rate of patients with fracture and patients with hip fracture. And then you see the graph is a Charles and Combo index. I will come later to the Charles and Combo index. With more or similar to three, we have a much higher mortality rate. And the second point I want to point out is also nursing home patients have a higher mortality rate. Nursing home patients are frail. That's also a fact. These are data from our own hospital, and you also can see the Charles and Combo index. If you have a Charles and Combo index from three to four, you have a mortality rate in the next 12 months from more than 20%. And if you have a, a Charles and Combo index from more than five, you have a mortality rate from nearly 35%. And it's very easy to calculate the Charles and Combo index. You have, I think, 17 items, and you have only to count the points, to calculate the bounds, bounds, points, sorry, and then you can see the mortality rate, if you have 0.3 to 4, you have a mortality rate for nearly 20% in the next 12 months. It's very simple. It takes just one minute. And what is frailty? I've told you about the patients in the nursing home. They have a higher risk for mortality rate, and the patients in the nursing homes are frail. And you can define frailty. The most common definition was done by Mrs. Fried. And this is gait velocity, a lower grip strength, exhaustion, inactivity, and weight loss. And if you have three or more criteria of them, the patient is frail. The patient can also live at home and be frail. That's also a fact. Step six, check the medication. These are data from Germany. And you see if the patients are 70 or 80 years old, they took nearly nine and over 80, nearly 10 medication each day. And it's very simple. The more medication, the higher the probability that you have to deal with a patient at risk of complication. So you have only to look at the list. The longer the list, the higher the risk. It's very simple. And 
there are some medications that, you, that should be stopped before you go into the operation. This is a long list, but I think a long list is not very important, so we shorten the list into five groups that are the diuretics on the day of the operation should be stopped because of the dehydration. It's hormone, hormone replacement therapy. It's not very common yet, but it was very common some years ago for the risk of thrombosis. Is metformin for renal failure are the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs for many reasons for heart failure, renal failure, ulcerous, and also, of course, oral anticoagulation. But you will hear it later from my colleague, Dr. Roth. And you have also a small list of benefit and risk medication. And here you have to focus only on two. It's aspirin and clopidogrel. And we will also discuss it later. But uh, it's very difficult. Maybe sometimes it's useful to have a higher risk for bleeding, especially in patients with a coronary stent. So it's a very difficult question sometimes. Step seven is the blood tests. Also look for hemoglobin, thrombocytes, blood sugar, creatinine for renal failure, electrolytes, and the coagulation test. Don't measure drop T or drop E or pro and TPMP for heart failure. Oh. We have measured drop T or drop E, and we have many patients, they have a slightly elevated drop T or drop E, and we have a delay of the, of, for the operation because we have to look for cardiac problems, and the patients have no cardiac problems. So don't do too much and don't do too few tests. So the recommendation for a stable patient is plan the operation as soon as possible. I've shown you the seven steps. It's really easy. The recommendation for an unstable patient is initiate a meeting of the interdisciplinary team. Set yourself a goal for the optimization of the patient. This is very important. And identify and treat correctable comorbidities immediately. So, and what is correctable? You see here also a list. Anemia, anticoagulation, volume depletion, electrolytes, uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled heart failure, uncontrolled hypertension, cardiac arrhythmia, acute chest infection, and exacerbation of a COPD. So, and what is your job? The first four are your job. That can you do? You can correct anemia, you can switch the anticoagulation, volume depletion, and electrolyte ambulance. This is not very difficult. The second, uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled heart failure, and uncontrolled hypertension. Start the therapy, I will show you, but this is not really your job. This is too complex. And the last three, this is really not your job. You have to call a geriatrician or a specialist. Why is dehydration so important? The prevalence is quite high, up to 3% in geriatric patients, and the older one up to 5%. And this is also important. Each second of them develops dehydration during the hospitalization. So we can avoid this. And the mortality rate is up to 30%, and the mortality risk increases by the factor 7 compared to other genetic patients. And mortality rate correlates with the level of dehydration. What can you do? You can calculate the water deficiency, but it's much easier to give the patients half a liter, 5% uh, glucose infusion in the first hour. It's no problem. It's very easy, but you have to do it. Preoperative management of heart failure. A stable heart failure patient doesn't need any further examination. Go into the operation. Don't start a beta blocker therapy preoperative. The time is too short. No fluid reduction because you have to avoid dehydration. It's always the same. Only new have four. Or reversing a new manifestation of heart failure indicates an optimization. And what you can do is also very easy in urinary, urinary data produce meet 40 milligram intravenous oxygen and start prophylaxis of thrombosis. In diabetes, what is the goal? Glucose should be under 200 milligram percent because if glucose is higher, it indicates a higher risk for infection up to not ratio from 10. And the goals are fluid balance, electrolytes, avoid ketoacidosis and avoid hyperantricoglycemia. And what you can do also with a give fluid, not glucose in that case, of course, and reduce blood glucose. That's a very simple rule. One unit insulin reduces blood sugar nearly by 30 milligram percent. So if you have a patient with 300, give him four units in insulin, and the next hour then we will have no problem. Maybe the blood sugar is 200, 220, or 180. Hypertension is also a big problem. 
the increased risk of cardiovascular complications probably four times, and you have an activation of the sympathetics by starting anesthesia, and the blood pressure rises by 20 to 30 mercury, and heart rate by 15 to 20. And in patients with untreated hypertension, it's much higher, up to 90 mercury, and heart rate up to 40. And you have also big fluctuations of the blood pressure during the operation. So this can really be a problem. What is the goal? The goal is a blood pressure of lower 140 to 90, up to 170 to 110 mercury. A delay of the operation is not necessary. We have only to act if systolic blood pressure is more than 180 and diastolic more than 110. And we have also to consider other causes of an elevated blood pressure like pain, agitation, hypoxia, hypovolemia, and urinary retention. And the treatment is also not so difficult. Urapidil, 12.5 milligram intravenous slowly, and you can repeat it after 20 minutes, after half an hour. So we go back to our case to the 80-year-old man, and you get the same question. So what is your answer now? Okay, can we see it on the big slide? The big. Oh, this was the first, and this was the second. Oh, this was not my intention. <laughs> <laughs> my intention was to encourage you <laughs> to check the page, <laughs> because it's really easy. So, we go again through the lecture. <laughs> okay, we repeat it. Step one to seven. <laughs> Step one is ask the patient make ECG. Step two is use your stethoscope. It's really easy. <laughs> Do a chest X-ray. Step four is physical examination. Step five is check the comorbidities. Step six, check the medication. And step seven is make the blood test not too much and not too few. So how can we summarize? I think to provide the best outcome, geriatric patients have enormous need for co-management. Bad is bad. That's also a fact. We should go as soon as possible into the operation. Usually by waiting for the operation, the clinical situation doesn't get better. If you indicate a delay, you have to fix a goal for your treatment. And this is a famous German actor, and he said, prognosis are very difficult, particularly if they concern the future. And that's also for our patients, sometimes it's very difficult. Thank you for your attention.